Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to This or That, a series on my channel where I share or sort of pit some of the decks in my collection against some of the other decks in my collection, as well as polling you guys to see which deck I should keep and which deck I should declutter. So in today's episode of This or That, we are going to be looking at another five pairs of decks that I'm going to pit head to head. So if you have missed it on my community tab on the community page here on my channel, I have been polling you guys to see which deck you prefer out of the different pairs of two that I will be running through this particular series. Today we're gonna to be looking at first the Land Sky Oracle versus the Yogic Path Oracle. <sighs> So the reason I'm doing this series in the first place is because there's a few places in my collection where I feel like I have a couple different decks that are serving a very similar purpose in my practice. And this was actually the pair that originally inspired this entire series because these are both yoga decks to me. They're both decks that I feel like um, are beautiful, uh, encapsulations of a yoga practice. And since yoga is an important part of my journey, it just is something that I really wanted to find that deck that was gonna just feel really beautiful to work with. And these are both beautiful in different ways. But before I get into my thoughts on this, let me first pop up for you the poll. So as you can see, this one was really, really close with, at the time I'm filming this, the Land Sky Oracle squeaking just ahead of a yogic path for a lot of you. I'm gonna share with you some of my thoughts and kind of make my decision on the fly. I have not come into the series or into filming this video with a pre-decision of what I'm gonna choose. Um, so I've gotta kind of figure it out on camera. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about that. Let's look at a yogic path first. This actually came into my collection second. Um, so I kind of wanna spend some time taking a peek at it. First off, this deck is illustrated by Danielle no Noel, um, and it comes with this beautiful outer sleeve, but the creator of the deck is actually Sahara Rose, who I follow on social media. She is a delight. If you want somebody to come up on your Instagram feed who's just gonna make you feel good every time you see her, Sahara Rose is it. She's got such a beautiful energy and light to her. Um, and this deck has such a gorgeous production quality. First of all, it's in this beautiful unwrapped uh, box, or unwrapped uh, magnetic box, and it says, may these cards bridge you to your highest self. There's a ribbon to lift out the guidebook and then also the um, separately boxed deck of cards. I mean, it's just no detail was missed. And I have to admit, I was a little bit seduced by all of this beautiful production quality. Originally, I had decided not to get this deck. Um, and then I and then I caved. <laughs> But it's, I mean, isn't it the most beautiful thing you've like ever seen? It's so gorgeous. Um, and the cards are absolutely stunning. So the backs of the cards look like this. They have this beautiful gold foil detailing and this gorgeous like yummy teal or turquoise color. It's, oh, it's just so pretty. Um, and then the artwork of course by Danielle Noel is absolutely breathtaking. Now it goes through quite a lot of uh, primary parts of a, of a yoga practice, more than just obviously the physical postures, but it, it has so much more depth to it than that. Now, I am familiar with a lot of these terms and am comfortable with them because of my background as a yoga teacher and as a yoga practitioner. Uh, I love the chakra cards in this deck. They're really beautiful. I will say though that it feels very, um, it does feel a little bit not tunnel vision, but that's the wrong word. It's beautifully focused on yoga and the themes of yoga. And I love that about this deck. I really, really do. But I find that the only time I ever want to reach for this deck, which is kind of true of the Land Sky Oracle too, if I'm being honest, but the only time I really want to reach for this is when I've unrolled my yoga mat and I'm going to do a practice and I want to pull a card for focus. And for that, it is really, really beautiful. However, similar to um, my... <sighs> I don't know how I want to say this. I feel like there's a little bit of distance between these cards and me. They feel a little bit less attainable or approachable in a way. Um, so I don't know, but gosh, it's beautiful. And the guidebook is, let's look, let's look at the guidebook. The cards are beautiful. Um, the one critique I have of this deck, sorry, before I go into the guidebook, the one critique I have is that it's all the Sanskrit words on the cards, which by itself is not necessarily an issue, especially for the ones that I'm very especially familiar with, which I would say is probably about 70% of the cards, but there is a small 30% where I run into a word I'm not familiar with. And in that way, while I'm learning slowly what those words are, 
by working with the guidebook, it does limit my use of this deck to being able to be used when I have the time to pull a card and then dive into the guidebook. And I do think that it's beautiful to work with in that way because the guidebook is so gorgeous. But let's let's look at that and I'll show you what I mean. Um, so the guidebook, again, beautiful quality through the guidebook as well. And look at these full color images. So you can totally work with this deck by pulling the card that you've drawn and then reading the message. Now there are upright and reversed messages here and if you're looking to really dive into depth, let's say you already have a physical asana yoga practice and you really want to dive into the rest of yoga, this is such a beautiful um, well put together way to do that. And I would definitely, definitely recommend it to people who are looking for that sort of support because it just introduces you to the concepts. And one of the things I find a deck like this to be really good at is if you're getting ready to do a yoga practice, like a physical yoga practice, and you wanna have a focus for your practice, something to kind of be marinating or meditating on while you move through the poses, this deck is really great for that because you can pull your card, look at your message, and then do your practice. Now, to be completely fair, I've done that with a number of different decks in my collection. I've done it with my uh, Whispers of Lord Ganesha deck. I've done it with other random oracle decks or tarot decks. To me, I don't need necessarily a specific deck for that specific purpose, if that makes any sense. Um, but it does limit to me how I want to use this deck. It there's no keywords here that I feel like really give me jumping off points for general oracle style messages. So it is it is a very specific purpose that I can use this deck for. Now, the Land Sky Oracle is similar. The Land Sky Oracle was originally an independently published deck. Oh, I should have said that. This deck is, um, the Yogic Path is published by Alpha. That's what it says here on the box, Alpha. Don't know who that is, but this is, um, you, I got this from a, a bookstore. Like you can get it from a bookstore. It's, it's mass market, maybe a smaller publisher, but it is, it is published by a traditional publisher. The Land Sky Oracle by Teresa Hutch. This was originally a independent deck <clears throat> and then US Games picked it up. So this is currently available from US Games. Now this deck originally came into my possession because I had picked up the White Sage Oracle also by Teresa Hutch um, and also by US Games. This is in a deck in a tin and this is such a beautiful little deck. And I loved the artwork. And I thought it'd be great to have an Oracle deck that I could pair with this. Um, this has a lot of chakra wisdom in it. It's pippish, but it's also really, really soft and beautiful. I love this little deck. Um, it's probably one of my favorite Tarot and a Tin decks. Um, I love the backings as well. So that's why I originally picked this up. I was so enjoying working with this that I was like, well, I've got to get her Oracle deck. And I thought it was only available um, as an independent deck, which I believe you can still order the ind independent version, or at least you could when I got the mass market, um, I think. I think. But uh, typically this is obviously more affordable to get locally and I actually do prefer the mass market version. There was a little bit of tweaking to the artwork where some of the cards that had a more kind of um, geometric design, a lot of those were replaced with actual artwork. Not actual artwork, it's all artwork. <laughs> but like they were replaced with a, with a, with a um, more uh, scenic sort of image, I guess. You could, not really scenic, but you know, hopefully you would know what I mean. <laughs> so less of these kind of more geometric style cards and then more of these other kinds of cards, basically. Um, so this one, here's the thing. They're both, both of these decks are 100% inspired by um, thematically attuned to a, a yoga practice. That is totally the point of these cards. Um, in fact, in the Land Sky Oracle, you get a really great reference card that references Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga, the Yamas, Niyamas, Asana, which is the physical practice a lot of us are more familiar with, Pranayama, which is the breath work, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. And it's really great to have a card that literally just reminds you of that. And in here you get uh, one, two, three, four, five cards in each category of the eight limbs of yoga. So this is a very balanced deck in that way. It is literally focused on the eight limbs of yoga. That is the entire theme of this deck. Um, it's also got a really beautiful fold out pamphlet, which let's see if I can zoom this out enough to be able to see this. This is another beautiful illustration of the eight limbs of yoga. Okay. So here we have the tree. So it explains what each one is. Dharana is concentration, pratyahara, turning inward. Yama is honor others. Niyama is honor yourself. Asana, physical postures. Pranayama, breathwork. Samadhi, enlightenment. And dhyana, meditation. And then on the back of this, 
um, is a yoga sutra that has in, is, is associated with each of these eight limbs. It's really well, well thought out. Um, and I love that it references the original, some of the um, stanzas of the original uh, yoga sutra in describing what each of these categories really is about. I think that's a really beautiful way to honor the origins of this deck or of the themes that are gonna be explored in this deck. I really, really love US Games cardstock as well. Um, what I really love though, one of the, my favorite things about this is that not only do you have these gorgeous watercolor images and the keywords so you know which what you're dealing with, like what the theme of this card is. So in this case, it's Saucha. And so then if you come over here, you're like, oh, Saucha is one of the Niyamas, right? And then from there, you have a keyword, purity. Now, I don't know if this was the case on the independent version of this deck, but on this US Games version, it is there. And that keyword is probably going to be the tipping point. I, I, I'm leaning definitely towards this deck because I feel like this is what makes this deck more versatile to me, is that we do have that keyword. And then on top of that keyword, we of course have a guidebook. And if we go to entry number eight for Saucha, Purity, we get a couple of keywords about that. So qualities, cleanliness and breath consciousness. Then it talks about it. We get that we get a yoga sutra stanza as well as some reflections, which you can also use as journal prompts and an affirmation. It's actually really well thought out, simple, but also powerful and potent. Um, it doesn't feel as overwhelming to work with. And if I want to pull one of these cards before my yoga practice um, to meditate on, I feel like this is just really beautiful for that. It's simple without being um shallow and it's got a lot of depth without being overwhelming it seems to fit itself right into that sweet spot so there are some of these cards which are um in the deck and there's one of these for each of the i forget the, the whole structure i wonder if i have a walkthrough on this deck i can't remember i think i do if i do i will link it um but yeah i love this i also love that we have some sort of deity representation here with hanuman there's a couple of others as well. I just, oh, I love these chimes. I just, I don't know, this feels like um, yoga home to me. Also, I have to say the palette, the color palette of this deck is very much what yoga feels like to me, right? It's this concept of softness and gentleness and connection to self and connection to the earth. And yeah, this just feels, there's also some physical poses in here, but just a few. So in asana, we have uh, matsyasana, which is this one, this is fish pose. We have Bhujangasana, which is uh, cobra pose, Ustrasana, which is camel pose, Vrikshasana, which is tree pose, and Tadasana, which is mountain pose. Those are all through this deck. And what I love about that is that the poses included are not these really like aggressive, uh, advanced physical postures, but actually very simple but powerful postures in such a way that just working with those postures alone could be a complete little practice. It wouldn't be like anything intense. Here's our Tadasana pose photo um, artwork. For mountain pose. Ustrasana camel pose. Anyways, this is beautiful. What am I even thinking? A steya, non-stealing, and it's a raccoon. Like, how perfect is the artwork? Um, yeah, I don't know why this is even a question. It's clear that I am definitely leaned towards this deck. I just think this deck is just the right fit for me personally for my yoga practice, which is how I want to primarily work with this deck. Um, and just in general, I feel like this one is definitely speaking my speak. And I love that I can use it just as an oracle deck because the keywords on there will let me use it just next to the White Sage Tarot or on its own paired with another deck. So it does have that little bit of, of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Flexibility or whatever. Even though, even though I'm probably going to mostly use this, I keep it with my yoga stuff. Like I'm probably going to mostly use it in my yoga practice, but it's nice to know that I can use it in other ways. Yeah, that was the point I was going to make there. So I'm going to be keeping the Land Sky Oracle and I'm going to be decluttering the Yogic Path uh, Oracle deck um, and guidebook by Sahara Rose. Again, this is beautiful. I just don't think I'll reach for it because I have the Land Sky Oracle and I think I do like that one better. There's something on my box. It's like a little schmooch. There's a little something there. But anyways, beautiful, beautiful deck. But yeah, that will be moving on to a new home at some point. Now, as I mentioned in the other videos about this series, any decks that I have decided to declutter will not be leaving my collection immediately. They're gonna go into kind of like a holding place for a few months so that I can make sure that I'm actually ready to let them go before I do. That just helps to keep me from impulsively letting things go and then wanting to repurchase them later. So they go into their like holding place and then eventually will find their way to new homes, probably. 
All right, so the next matchup in our this or that is the Vintage Botanical Oracle against the Botanical Inspiration cards. So the Botanical Inspiration cards are a mass market deck and the Vintage Botanical Oracle is a bit of an interesting one because it is a DIY deck. This was a deck where the creator made all of the images available um, to download so that you could have this deck printed yourself at like make playing cards and that's what I did. So um, it's not something you can easily just go purchase. It is something that I had printed and made. But all of that aside, let me pop up the, the survey so you can see how you guys voted on this one. So at the time I am filming this, um, it looks like the preference has been for the vintage, oh no, sorry, I'm wrong. This is another neck and neck one, but the botanical inspiration cards are just ahead of the vintage botanical oracle. I think part of that could also be because not as many people are familiar with this or because this is harder to get, but I've been trying to poll everybody based on what deck you guys prefer, and it does seem like right now Botanical Inspirations is winning out. So let's get a little zoom in going, and we'll see about these. So let's start this time with the Botanical Inspirations deck, because this is the one that I've had the longest. Um, first of all, can we talk about this beautiful little flip top box? Really lovely. Um, and when you pull this out, you actually get your deck of cards, a little guidebook, and there's also, I have it under the ribbon. Um, there's a little title card, which I keep under the ribbon. And I also have this Secret Language of Flowers little pullout sheet, which has basically what each flower stood for, and I believe this is based on uh, Victorian times. I could be wrong. Somebody's probably gonna have to tell me in the comments because I can't remember. Um, but this is a deck that's entirely floral based. So each, each card in this deck is based on flowers. Now right off the bat, I will say I am not a fan of the backing. Like I love it in general, like if it didn't have this frame and the words, I just don't like words on the back of decks. But then again, both of these decks have words on the back. So nobody wins out in that way. Um, one of the things that I really love about this deck is the beautiful like parchment backing. Um, I also really love that you get the illustration of the flower, you get its name, both its common name and its botanical name, a theme. So in this case, we have Trumpet Gentian and its power and healing. And then there's a quote. Now I am a sucker for quotes. <laughs> so it says, to get what you love, you first have to be patient with what you have unknown. And I love that. And then when you get into the guidebook for each card, so this is the Trumpet Gentian. I think they are um, alphabetical. Yes. You also get this, um, you get the same quote repeated here as well as like a, a message, but then there's this inspirational message and these are really great. So for this card, it says, in your desire to heal and grow, summon your strength, not through will, but in patient acceptance of the process that is required to bring true recovery. And so this deck was one that when I got it, I thought it was just going to be a fluffy, basic little oracle deck. And it's turned out to have actually a lot more depth than I thought. Um, it's also one of the few decks that I feel like I can pair with an older deck of various time periods and not have it feel like it's going to clash. Like it's just flowers on parchment, right? So I can put this next to any Marseille deck or any um, historical deck or any um, like Danny's Mystic Masters or any of those kinds of decks. And it doesn't clash because there's no specific time period really visible on the card, and yet that parchment feel gives it an old feel, which may sound really superficial, but it's definitely something that I really have come to appreciate about this deck. Um, it's just it's just kind of special, and it's I feel like it's very supportive and gentle, but also has that ability to kind of call you out a little bit. There's not, to be honest, quite a lot of, I love Snapdragons, there's not a lot of, of decks that I feel like, um, I really want to work with when it comes to more botanical stuff. As much as I love the earthly energies, I just find a lot of them don't practically work out very, they don't tend to be very flexible in my experience. Um, and this is, I think, an exception because it seems like it's not going to be very flexible. It seems like it's going to be very specific. And yet it's just a great little deck to work with. And I like that I can pair it with a lot of things. So that's a point in favor of the botanical or several points in favor of the botanical inspirations. Now the vintage botanical. This is exciting because this deck has, I believe, if I remember correctly, 100 cards. Um, I had it printed on 330 GSM Smooth cardstock. It's a lovely stock. It feels like a classic, um, like a 1990s US Games cardstock. And what's neat about this, let's zoom in, 
is that each image has an actual botanical drawing. And the neat thing about botanical drawings of the herb or plant that's represented is that it shows you like what the plant looks like, but then it also has little cutaways for like what the flower looks like and the seed looks like and the root looks like. And that that's just kind of cool. It reminds me of like science posters um, in, in classrooms or in um, doctor's offices or whatever. And what I love about this deck and the reason why I went to the trouble of uploading all the images and having it printed is because I love that you get this herb, you get this great illustration, and then you get keywords. So for Golden Seal, it's Rise and Conquer. Now there's no book, right? It's just the images and the keywords. Sage, the Rise and Fall. But when I got it in, I was so excited because there's such a great variety of plants in here. There are plants that you can eat. There are plants that are poisonous. There are flowers. There are herbs. It really runs the gambit. Um, it's really just a full like sort of ca a catalog of, of botanics. Uh, but I something happened with this deck where whenever I would try to read with it, even though I did some sample reading with it when I first did my walkthrough, which I linked in the community tab when I asked you guys this or that, but also, um, I just, I feel like when I went to work with it, it just, I kept getting like these dissonant readings where I would pull this to be like the energy of the day or I would pull it to, to, to kind of read. It actually reads fairly well predictively, but that's not how I read most of the time for myself. So I just, I found myself just never really wanting to reach for it. And that's the thing. I don't reach for botanical inspirations a lot, um, but I know that when I do, it will give me a harmonious reading with whatever deck I'm, other deck I'm working with, or if I just want to pull a few cards. Whereas I feel like this one is almost more fortune tellery in a really cool way. It's just that that's not what most of my readings for myself are about. So I feel like this would work really well for um, a certain kind of client reading. <clears throat> Like if I was reading um, Fast and Loose kind of at a event or something, this would probably be a really great deck. But I don't do that super often. I tend to do most of my readings via my website. So they are recorded video readings. Um, and this deck just doesn't, it's, it doesn't lend itself to that the way that I want. Like here we have Abundance Without Substance in the Cabbage Rose. That's a great keyword jumping off point intuitively, but it kept falling flat. Then you have something very specific like Camphor where it's improved physical wellness. Well, that's less expansive, right? It kind of pigeonholes me into a particular meaning and that's what I really struggle with. And I know that if I were to trim the keywords off and work with this deck without the keywords, it wouldn't work for me because these drawings, while they're kind of neat to look at, they don't really spark my intuition at all. And to be fair, neither does the drawing of the flowers in Botanical Inspirations, right? It's just flowers. So I really am relying on the, in both of these decks, I'm relying on the keywords and the guidebook in the case of Botanical Inspirations to get an effective reading. And I don't need multiple decks like that in my collection. I do feel like of the two, I just feel like Botanical Inspirations is more versatile and gives me more meaningful messages. Whereas with this, I feel like I'm kind of like forcing it to work whenever I use it. Now that said, it's really cool. Um, and if you're really into herbs and plants, or if you, um, if that's a huge part of your practice, and I do work with herbs, but this isn't even just a deck of, of like local herbs or of herbs like the, um, the Hedgewitch Botanical Oracle, which I also had and traded after a time. That had herbs and plants which could be found in my sort of geographic area. So there was a bit of a connection to the land. And even that one I didn't end up getting on with over the long term. So I just think this deck is probably not for me. So this one I'm going to rehome and I'm going to keep botanical inspirations. Okay, so so far we're even Steven here. We've kept one and we've decluttered one. Time for our next matchup. So now we have the Alchemical Tarot by Robert M. Place and the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus also by Robert M. Place. So before I get into my thoughts, I will pop the survey up so that you guys can see how you guys voted. And overwhelmingly, you guys voted for the Alchemical Tarot. My copy is the renewed fourth edition. It is my understanding that the fifth edition of this deck comes in similar packaging and with similar cardstock as the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus, but I did pick up this deck first and then this deck. So let me share with you some of my thoughts. So let's take a look first at the Alchemical Tarot Renewed 4th Edition. So I also have here printed, this is like a little um, 
printable um, sort of little white book, I guess you could say, that I did print and um, sort of staple bind and I even like taped over the staples so they wouldn't be pokey. And I keep this um, in the bag with this deck. Now, a couple things about this. I can't stand the backings. They have a, a reason that they're like this. They're, this this backing has a, a meaning. And when I purchased this deck, I also purchased the big mega book. Here, let me just grab it and show you. I purchased this book, the Tarot Magic Alchemy Hermeticism and Neoplatonism Second Edition. Now, I would like to point out that I have read this entire book cover to cover and it's actually really really good like you can see my like highlights that run all the way through it um this is essentially like a really beefy guidebook for the alchemical tarot and i learned a lot reading this book i think this is if you're interested in tarot's history or if you're interested in the evolution of tarot this is such a great book to read it looks and sounds really highbrow and really intimidating, but Robert and Place's writing style is actually very easy to read and very approachable. Um, I This is probably the biggest, well it is the, I even printed out, look at this, an alchemical table of symbols, which I printed out to keep in this. Um, I really enjoyed this book, thoroughly. Like I read the crap out of this book. Um, here's the thing with the alchemical tarot. I think it's really pretty, um, but to me, I basically, this deck represents my experience learning about the relationship between tarot and alchemy. And I love these images. I think they're fantastic. And I love Robert M. Place's illustration style. However, I never reach for this deck to read with because it's almost so heavy and so full of depth that it just sits there unused. Now I can pull it out and flip through the cards and really appreciate this deck but even now, I'm not really feeling like it's a deck I would wanna pull out and actually read with. I freaking love this death card so much. Um, and it has the, each card has alchemical symbols on it so that you know, like this is the um, four of vessels and there's also the alchemical symbol for water. But then on the death card, we have, I think it's putrefaction. I'm pretty sure it's putrefaction. Um, the stage of alchemy that that card is associated with. It's really a cool deck, particularly if you are interested in reading the tarot magic, alchemy, hermeticism, and neoplatonism. Um, this is such a great tool to really work with. I worked with this deck, I wanna say for a month or three months. I can't remember now, but I worked with it for, yeah, I think it was, I think it was a month. I think I worked with this deck exclusively in January, I wanna say, I can't remember. I did a study, <laughs> but I worked with it for a length of time. I really got familiar with it. I really got familiar with the processes of alchemy that are depicted in the cards. It was a really fun deep dive for me and one that I, it's just, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, so it would've been last year. Sorry, just thinking out loud. Anyway, um, that is the, Alchemical Tarot. There is an alternate lover's card. There's like a more chaste one and then a, a lot more uh, passionate one. I have the passionate one currently shuffled into the deck, so I keep that one um, separate. So that is the the original, the Alchemical Tarot. Mine, the fourth edition. Um, but then I found out about the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus from Dustin. Um, now this calls itself an iconic edition of the Alchemical Tarot distilled to its essence. Um, first of all, the packaging of this one is really beautiful. Um, I love this sort of slide out sort of fabric covered um, box. And inside we do have a uh, little white book, which does a great job of taking us through the key symbols that are re referenced on every single card and taking us through the major arcana, which takes us through the alchemical process, which is so cool. Um, I like the planar backs of this deck and it is gilded. It's a matte deck, but here's the big thing with this deck. My camera was like, nope, you have to start again. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure entirely where it cut me off, but I was basically just talking about how with this deck, you really need to look into the artwork of every card and look for those symbols and really consider the image and how it depicts that stage of the alchemical process. Whereas with the alchemical magnum opus, it says right on it what it is, lapis philosoph philosophorum. This is the philosopher's stone. Um, the Interesting and really cool thing about this deck is that it's fairly pippish, but there is a key symbol on every single minor arcana card that is a, uh, a nod to the artwork from the original alchemical tarot. So for example, in the Five of Swords, 
So in the Five of Swords, we have a guy here who is working with a hammer and anvil. And here in the Alchemical Magnum Opus, the, the key theme here is the work with the hammer and anvil. So but this deck can also work beautifully with Robert M. Place's book. It still beautifully illustrates the same concepts that were illustrated in the original um, Alchemical Tarot. But it's a little more monochromatic, which normally not my thing. But what I really love is that the alchemical symbols are beautifully distilled into this artwork. And I really like the pippish quality. Like here in the seven of coins, like that is the most important in my opinion. And obviously in Robert M. Places, since it's what he chose to use to illustrate the card. But that is the most important symbol from the fully illustrated version or the more scenically illustrated version of the same exact card is that um, series of the seven coins, which is associated with the seven planets. So here we go. Here's the original and here's the magnum opus. So while the artwork is not as full, full colored or as detailed, the key themes, the key takeaways from every card is still present. And because it is a pip deck, I can read it very simply like a pip deck and I can choose whether or not I'm going to factor in all the alchemical representations. But the key theme, the key feeling, here we have the nine of swords and we have that fearful face. It makes this a really cool kind of hybrid deck between a Rider Waite Smith and a Marseille deck or a pip deck because you do get these visual elements and then what I really love is that the majors, instead of being called the hermit, exaltation. We still see the hermit. We have the Ouroboros there, but we know which stage of the alchemical process we're in without me having to remember, <laughs> which I think is really, really cool. We have the fox in the seven of swords, which is so great. The owl in the two of swords. It's really a smart deck. I love that the four of coins is still digging, just like he, the same figure is digging in the four of coins in the alchemical tarot. So what I realized is that I actually prefer this deck, yeah. And I think, I think I've known that for a while. I think I just really, really love how beautifully depicted the original is. It's so pretty, but I don't read with it. And I found that if I have a deck that I have just cause it's pretty, it needs to be something that I wanna look at a lot for me to consider keeping it even though I don't read with it. And this one just gets ignored. Because once I studied it and I learned from it, this was all I needed then, right? So I think that it's pretty clear for me. I think this is one that I kind of had a feeling this was way, the way I was gonna go when I pitted it against the alchemical tarot. Do you need both? No. Is it cool to have both because both show different sort of, are different ways of working with the alchemical process in tarot? Yes, it's very cool to have both but I've only been reaching for this one. And this one, I've actually not even put in a bag. I've been keeping it on a shelf so that I remember it's there, so that I remember to reach for it. And yeah, it's just, it's really unique and special in my collection. So I'm going to keep the Tarot of the Alchemical Magnum Opus, um, and I am going to be rehoming and decluttering the Alchemical Tarot fourth edition. Now, again, I believe that the new edition is in very, or the fifth edition anyways, was in very similar packaging to this one um, and similar cardstock. So, it, and I don't know if it came with a little white book or not, but that's another thing about this. It comes with a little booklet, whereas with the Alchemical Tarot, I had to print one off so I could have one to keep with the deck when I'm working with it. So that will be rehomed and it will, it's little um, printed out book will go with it. But like I said, I'm gonna put this in like holding for a period of time first. So, so far we're still one in one guys. Three decks keeping, three decks going. <laughs> okay, so our next pairing, oh, this is a toughie. Our next pairing is the Herb Crafters Tarot and the Tarot of Trees. Now this is kind of an oddball pairing, <laughs> but I just really wasn't sure how I wanted to <laughs> These are such, such obnoxiously different sizes. I wasn't sure how I wanted to approach these two because these are also two that I feel like kind of get neglected but kind of have a similar energy for me. Uh, before I get into my thoughts though, let me pop up the survey. So at the time that I am filming this, the Herb Crafters Tarot and the Tarot of Trees are pretty close with the Herb Crafters Tarot nudging just ahead of the Tarot of Trees. Now, of course, voting stays open. So if y'all wanna tip the balance, feel free to go in and vote. But, and that's something else. Any of the decks you see featured during this or that, you can always add your vote or change your vote after the video, that's totally fine. But I do like to share where the vote was at at the time that I filmed it. So the Herb Crafters Tarot. Oh. 
I want to love this deck so, so badly. And if you have this deck and are struggling to connect with it, I really encourage you to go look at um, Sarah Sunset Bow's channel. She has a beautiful and detailed walkthrough of this deck that is so well done and made me want to love this deck even more. <laughs> um, the Herbcrafters Tarot is one that I've had on my list that I've wanted to study actually for a long time. As far as like an herbal deck, this is the, the best one I've ever seen, uh, particularly an herbal tarot that that merges tarot with um, herbs. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not just an herbal oracle or whatever, an herbal tarot. Um, this is the best one that I've seen. It's so beautiful. And I love this artwork style. Now, the Herb Crafters Tarot was done by Joanna Powell Colbert, the artwork, and the guidebook was written by Letitia Guthrie. Now, Joanna Powell Colbert is also the creator of the... Gaia Tarot. Gaia Tarot or Gaia Tarot, um, which is also beautiful. And I, again, I love this art style. I find these scenes so soothing to look at and so immersive. I love this cinnamon card. <clears throat> this is so pretty. And I love the backings. I love that it's very um, sort of er working, actual working with herbs. Again, compared to that vintage botanical um, oracle that I was showing earlier, this one feels like it's full of like teaching and wisdom about how to work with the plants, how to get to know them, how to bring them into your practice. I think if you're interested in naturopathy or kitchen witchery, you'd probably really, really enjoy working with this deck. My problem is, even though like the Major Arcana, here we have... Um, Awakening, which is the judgment card, and we have Tulsi. Unfortunately, because the artwork, fortunately or unfortunately, I should say, the artwork really focuses on the herb, as it should. It's the herb crafter's tarot. But because of that, I don't get a lot from the artwork because I'm not familiar enough with these herbs to really get the full value from a deck like this without really studying this deck. And this is another one of those decks that while I recognize that that study would probably cause me to really bond closely with this deck, I have not felt excited about this study. And because I haven't felt excited about it, it's just languishing in my collection. But I also feel like if I do study it, look at this three of water lemon balm. There's like a mouse on this little chair. It's like a little tea party. Oh, it's so cute. Um... Whenever I've worked with this deck and I've worked with the guidebook, I have come around, come away from it feeling like I've learned a little something. Um, and the messages are good when I work with it with the guidebook. But again, it just, it feels like an awful lot of work and I'm not necessarily feeling motivated to do that work. So that's one of the reasons why I realized I needed to examine whether this was meant to stay in my collection or not. Now, the other deck that's kind of in this category is the Tarot of Trees. Now I have the mini edition. I am, by the way, gutted. So this deck came out in a large anniversary edition on a beautiful, beautiful cardstock. And then she's reprinted this one. And I'm pretty sure it's um, the same as this. Like it's at least semi-gloss if it's not glossy. And I'm like, no, I wish it would come out in this size, but matte. Um, but anyway, so here's the thing about this deck. It's not gonna teach me anything about herbs or plants but it does tap me into the beautiful energy of trees and of the element of earth. And so this is a deck I really feel like I wanna reach for whenever I wanna tap into that earthly energy. And I love trees. This is a deck that I get something out of whenever I pull it out and work with it. It's very Rider Waite Smith and you can really see the cleverness in how the art is done to really make you think of the what the card means means right what it what it's depicting so if you're familiar with the writer weight smith despite the fact that this deck is basically all trees i think you'd actually do fine reading this right out of the gate it's not an effortful deck it feels uh very easy to just pick up and throw down spreads and i think it's really cool the way everything's depicted there is a human-ish kind of element to the posture and the behavior of the trees as depicted in the artwork and i love that i love that it makes them feel like spirits or beings and not just like just not just trees <laughs> do you know what I mean because I do believe that trees have a spirit and an energy to them and I feel like we get to see that in this deck which is just it's really cool I can't stand the glossy cardstock um but that is really my biggest beef with this deck it's also got some really beautiful seasonal depictions um where you can clearly tell that the swords are autumn that the pentacles are winter the wands are summer and the cups are spring and I just I love that um yeah I think like I knew I kind of knew pairing these that it wasn't quite completely fair 
to the Herb Crafters Tarot because I do really like the Tarot of Trees, but I also wasn't sure if I needed more than one deck like this that really connects me to that earthy element, at least as far as tarot is concerned. Um, and I do actually have a couple of other decks that I could say are earthy, but these are my earthy est. And that being the case, I think for me, it's pretty clear that um, I'm going to reach for the Tarot of Trees a lot more often than I will reach for the Herb Crafters Tarot. I also think, like, I could consider keeping them both, but I think, honestly, I'm just not going to put the work that's required for me to get the most out of working with the Herb Crafters Tarot into it. And I think with that being the case, it really needs to go to somebody who wants to put that work in or who has already done that work and already has a really close relationship with these herbs and plants and can really mine the gold out of this deck. So I think I am going to stick with my Tarot of Trees. Plus it'd really be a shame to have this bag go unused. <laughs> I love this bag. Peggy made this for me just for my Tarot of Trees and it is perfection. So my Tarot of Trees is going to stay and my Herb Crafters Tarot is going to go. And that, my friends, brings us to our last pairing. And this one might surprise you that these decks were even up for consideration for being rehomed in my collection, but they both are up for that consideration. Because shockingly, I don't reach for either very often, and I think it's for a similar reason. So the first of these is the Crow Tarot by MJ Cullinane. This is the mass market US games version of this deck. And the other one is the Crystal Unicorn Tarot by Pamela Chen. Here's why I pitted, nope, before I get into my thoughts, here's the survey. So it is an overwhelming majority of you who prefer the Crow Tarot over the Crystal Unicorn Tarot. Here's my thing. <laughs> I'm sure at first glance you guys are like, Lisa, this isn't fair because we know you love unicorns, so it's no contest. Okay, but I never reach for this deck, very rarely. And I think it's for a similar reason, so let me get into that. Um, both of these decks are essentially Rider Waite Smith decks but focused on one singular creature theme. In the Crow Tarot, obviously it's crows, and in the Crystal Unicorn Tarot, obviously it is unicorns. Now there's also a crystal element to this deck, which to be fair, I haven't really fully explored. But let's get into, let's go into the Crystal Unicorn Tarot first. So I wanna be incredibly clear, this deck is a delight, both cardstock quality, and this one is an independent deck as well, not a mass market, um, which is worth being aware of. So, this is a classic Rider Waite Smith clone deck, by which I mean that these are the classic Rider Waite Smith scenes, of course, redrawn um, with unicorns as our um, protagonists. So it's it's basically a Rider Waite Smith deck. And I think that's actually one of the reasons I don't reach for this deck is because I actually don't reach for Rider Waite Smith to read with just right out of the gate very often. I would like to reach for this deck more than I do because I do so love unicorns and this deck does have a inner child friendly kind of my little pony feel with the little crystals because of course in this deck for each suit you have a primary crystal so throughout the cup suit there's these little rose quartz gems on the unicorns bums because rose quartz is the crystal associated that that Pamela Chen is associated with the cup suit. I love the fun font on this deck. Um, I love, I love this. Um, I really do love it and I love touching it. I love shuffling it. Um, I pull it out and look at it sometimes because it just makes me happy to look at. But uh, yeah, I don't reach for it as often as I would like to, to actually read with it. Um, and I'm not, I, I, again, I think the main reason is because it's just basically, it's basically like a Rider Waite Smith deck. Nothing wrong with that, but yeah, here we have the Emperor and I think that's a Ruby and an emerald and the empress. Yeah, anyways, I would really love to bond with this deck a little bit more. Um, I actually have one of the eight of pentacles cards here where there's only seven pentacles visible on the card. Um, and I did get the new card, um, the replacement card, uh, that actually has the correct number of pentacles on it. But there's something ever so slightly different about the card stock on this one. And it's, it's, minuscule, but I can always tell where the card is in my deck when I shuffle it. So I just keep the visually correct one in the back. Um, but anyway, anyways, this is really pretty. I don't need to belabor the point. It is pretty. I do like it, but I just, I don't reach for it. I would like to though. And I think that's the thing. Um, the Crow Tarot, gosh, this is one of the best decks. I think that us games like production quality wise, and just the overall look of look and feel of this deck. I think this is one of my favorites that us games has done. These are probably one of my favorite tarot backings ever. 
I love these kind of patterned tarot backings. I think they're so elegant and lovely. Um, and this deck is really, really smart. I think if you're drawn to crows, this is such a beautiful deck to connect to that energy. There is something about this artwork that I am in equal parts completely mesmerized by and love and also find myself feeling too removed from. It's as if I react to this deck the way I would react almost to a photographic deck, even though I recognize this isn't photography or where it has been photography. It's been manipulated and tweaked and collaged, but it still feels like photos to me in some weird way. And it's not, it's beautifully layered. There's tons of beautiful collage work in this deck. And one of my main things about this one is that um, I like, I like the aesthetics of this deck so much. There was another point I was going to make there and I totally lost it. I like the aesthetics of this deck so much, but I'm not particularly bonded to crows themselves. I really wanted to keep this deck and have actually kept this deck for a long time because I wanted a deck that could stand in for an, the air element. If I wanted to do an elemental based reading, this is one of the only decks I could think of that would really cover that air element for me. Speaking of which, I would love to hear in the comments down below if you have a, a deck that just screams air to you. Um, because yeah, but anyway. Um, and that's one of the reasons I held this is because I don't have any other bird sort of themed tarot. And I thought it might be nice to have this as part of a collection where I could like pull some elemental based decks. But the reality is I never, ever reach for this deck to read with unless I have thrown it into my spin the wheel thingy and um, randomly selected a deck for myself. It's come up that way before, but never because I've been like, I'd really like to work with the Crow Tarot today. Never, not once. And I think that's the thing. Um, with the Crystal Unicorn Tarot, I have a desire because of my passion for unicorns to spend time bonding with this. I have like no desire to spend time bonding this with this, even though I appreciate it so much. Do you ever have a deck like that where you want to love it so, so badly and you don't, and you just want, you want it to happen. You're, just, you're waiting for that click. This is such a gorgeous deck. If you are at all bonded to or feel a connection with crows, man, this one deserves a look, but I just, I never, ever want to reach for it. And I had the same experience with MJ Coolanine's Wise Dog Tarot, and I am a total dog person, but it wasn't my dogs. And like, I don't know, I just I had that same experience with the artwork where I, in equal parts, love it and think it's so beautiful and I'm so drawn to it, but also feel like I can't connect to it. It's the strangest thing, but I do think that the Crow Tarot does need to leave my collection and I'm going to keep, for now, the Crystal Unicorn Tarot. I, I, I really want to bond with this. I think I would have a hard time parting with this. This is one of those decks I could see myself keeping for my collection, even if I don't reach with it that much, just reach for it that much, just because I love unicorns so much. So yeah, I actually did good this time. So I have managed to um, declutter five decks and I am keeping five decks. So let me get us zoomed out and let's take a look at the final tally here. So I'm keeping my unicorns, my tarot of trees, my alchemical magnum opus, my botanical inspirations, and my land sky oracle. So I think I did pretty good. I do love all these decks. I do want to work with these decks more. And I think pairing this collect part of my collection down by half will make it easier to reach for these decks because they won't have anything else that I also am not sure about sort of interfering with my interest in reaching for them. So that is today's episode of This or That. I can't wait for the next one. Make sure that you have been voting in the polls. And if not, it's not too late. Go check out the community tab on my channel and just click to vote on your favorite of any of the decks I've talked about today or in my previous episode of This or That, which I will link in the cards or in the description box down below. And where I have walkthroughs of these decks, I will also try to link those in the cards or in the description box. So you can check those out and get more of my cohesive thoughts on all of these. This episode ran long because I had lots of things I wanted to talk about, but thank you so much for hanging out with me. Don't forget to click the like button if you enjoyed this video or if you found value in it. Please do subscribe if you're new here and don't forget to click the bell so you're notified of my future videos. Thank you so, so much and may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye guys.